Okay, so guys, today what we're going to do is we are going to start having the okay, but why is this important conversations. So guys, we are done. Well, we're done talking specifically about intermolecular forces. We understand induced dipoles, dipole-dipole. We understand hydrogen forces. We understand ion-dipole. Guys, we understand all of these ideas. Today, we get to start talking about the so what's. So what you're going to see is we are going to start by reviewing what you should remember from last year about the phases of matter, solids, liquids, and gases. Then, guys, what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce you to something called phase diagrams. You've never seen these before from me or maybe in general chemistry. But, guys, we're going to dig into these things called phase diagrams. And then, guys, we're going to wrap up with solids. It's in chapter 12. I know I said we're gonna skip chapter 12. We're gonna talk about like two little ideas in chapter 12 and that's gonna be our day and that's where we're gonna wrap up. You guys ready to go? Okay, so guys, please, especially at first, take notes very judiciously. So guys, the idea goes like this. Why do we care about intermolecular forces? And guys, the answer is all the stuff that you skipped on the last test. So on the last test, I had you skip a lot of the free response questions because you couldn't answer them. Well, now we're gonna start talking about them. So guys, the first thing we're gonna talk about is solids, liquids, and gases and their properties. So guys, any questions, concerns, or heartache with any of these ideas? So guys, gases, remember how we said this last year? How did we abbreviate take on shape and volume? Tosvok. So guys, gases, Tosvok, they take on the shape and the volume of their container. They are wildly compressible because of all of the space between the molecules. They readily diffuse, which means they spread out really easily. They flow, which is weird to think that gas flows, but it does. Um, gases have very, very high levels of freedom. And guys, why is this true? What is it about gases that make all these things true? no intermolecular forces, right? Now you gotta be careful because guys, you understand enough to know this. Anything has intermolecular forces, right? Even nonpolar molecules, even things like CH4, which I normally have built, but I don't. So guys, this is a methane molecule. This is Bunsen burner gas. So let's talk about it. Symmetrical, yeah. polar, no, so that's why it's a gas, right? Because this is symmetrical and therefore nonpolar, it wants to be a gas, but we can turn it into a liquid. Guys, if we compress CH4 enough, we can squish it down enough and we can get the molecules close enough together that they stick and liquefy. What intermolecular forces cause that to happen? induced dipoles. But then the idea is the minute we let off the pressure, they spread out, they regasify, and off we go. But guys, understand that as these molecules move around inside a sample of methane, they run into each other, right? And when they run into each other, they still have the ability to induce dipoles, but then they immediately spread out. It's not until we compress or cool them that they stay close enough together to induce dipoles and become a liquid. Get the idea? Okay. So then guys, talking about liquids. Anything surprising here? Liquids take on the shape of their container, but not their volumes. Um, they don't expand to fill the container. Um, they are virtually incompressible. That's why hydraulics work. Guys, if you don't understand this, all the big machinery that we use to build buildings and dig holes, all of those things work by having liquid pumps, oil, and they pump on the liquid and that liquid doesn't compress and it moves and it causes pistons to expand and contract and causes digging motions. So guys, that's why hydraulics work because if you push on that liquid and it were to compress, it would compress rather than move and it wouldn't transfer energy well. So these are virtually compressible. They do diffuse, but more slowly, but liquids also flow really well. So guys, let's talk about why all of these things are true. Why do liquids not expand to fill containers? 
they do have intermolecular forces. So guys, when we talk about liquids, we talk about this, and liquids do exhibit intermolecular forces, therefore they're stuck together, they don't spread out, they do all the things that they do, but what don't they have that makes them different from solids? Structure, crystalline structure. Is that where you were headed, Jason? Yeah, so guys, the idea is the liquids then have intermolecular forces, but not structure. Then when we talk about the solids, they retain their shape and volume. They are also incompressible, although there are some really cool YouTube videos about compressing solids under an electron microscope, and you can actually see them compress if you push on them hard enough. It's pretty cool. There's also really cool videos about getting solids to dissolve into each other. It's really neat. You, take, you, you literally take two solids and sit one on top of the other and then train an electron microscope on that boundary and then compress them hard enough and you can watch them dissolve into each other. It's pretty cool. Um, and then guys, obviously solids don't flow very well, right? And so guys, what is all this boil, boil down, sorry. What does all this come down to? Why is all of this true? What's it all about? Structure. Okay, so it goes structure, IMFs, but no structure, then no IMFs. So guys, we bring that all together and we look at it like this. You good? Okay, so guys, while we're talking about this, we then need to talk about how we make these changes. So if we take a liquid and if we heat it, well, yeah, so if we take a liquid and if we heat it, it turns into a gas. If we cool it, it turns into a, it would take the gas, cool it, it turns back into the liquid. But guys, you're going to need to understand, and we'll talk about this more after the weekend, compression can do this as well. You can actually take a liquid and get it to boil by simply removing the pressure that's on it and you can also take a gas and cause it to liquefy by increasing the pressure. Guys, if you're not aware of that, then you don't understand what's going on with this can. You guys ever, well, do you guys know what's in here? These dusters? This is actually air. All they did was shoved air inside of a canister because it, I, you can probably hear it. Let's see. Can you hear that slosh around? Guys, what's in there is actually liquid air. So what causes the air to become a liquid? Pressure. So you take this gas and you compress it enough and the molecules get close enough together that they stick together. By the way, guys, what IMFs are holding this together as a liquid? They're all induced dipoles. If you look at the gases that are in air, like oxygen, nitrogen, O2, N2, they're all wildly symmetrical molecules. So guys, the only force that holds this together are induced dipoles. And the minute you do that, the pressure comes off, they can expand, they move away from each other and they turn into a gas. And that's what's going on here. The liquid, as you reduce pressure, can turn into a gas. And guys, we're gonna talk a lot more about that in the coming days as we spend three days and talk just about gases. So, you guys good on this? Yeah, Bailey. Yeah. That, that's exactly what's happening is this is boiling. So right now under this pressure, and you never think of it this way, but pressure, boiling is not just a, well, we can do it. Boiling is not just a function of temperature. It can also be a function of pressure. And as a result, we can do this. You can actually get water to boil at room temperature. Have you ever seen this? Yeah, I hate, I hate this, but I can show you. Yeah, so I'm gonna. Yeah, so the, so the idea is that you've always seen boiling as being the function of adding heat, but we can also get liquids to boil by removing pressure. So you know where this is going. You cover this up, pull this down, and if it can't suck in air, this becomes a vacuum, no pressure. Just like here, removing the pressure. So when we do this and then pull this down, when we remove the pressure, the water boils, right? Not because it's hot, but because the pressure's off and the intermolecular forces aren't enough to keep it together. 
Well, that's functionally what you're doing here. You let the, you open this up and all of a sudden the pressure goes down and literally inside this, if you could see, it's boiling. It's bubbling out and it's boiling just like boiling water. Yeah, isn't that cool? Yeah, there you have it. So guys, you good on this idea? We're good? Okay, so now let's talk terminology. So when we talk about these ideas, these are the terms that you need to understand organized into an energy diagram. So if we take a solid and heat it, it melts. If we cool it, it freezes. But guys, because you understand these energy diagrams, you understand that up is more energy. So take a liquid, add energy, it vaporizes, take a gas and remove energy and it condenses. But guys, let's talk about something really quickly. Just looking at these three layers, what do you notice about their relative positions? Does it take more energy to boil a substance or melt it? Boil it. Why? Why would it take more energy to boil a substance than melt it? Got to break the IMFs. What's breaking right here? Structure. Right here, IMFs. And it takes more energy to break IMFs than it does to break structure. As a result, guys, almost, not always, but generally, it takes more energy to boil a substance than it does to melt a substance. But then, guys, you understand this can also happen. Solids can go straight to the gas phase. They can sublimate. Um, carbon dioxide is probably the example of this that you're familiar with. We call it dry ice. Guys, it's dry ice because when carbon dioxide uh, goes out of its solid phase, it doesn't hit the liquid phase, it goes straight to the gas phase. You guys also know that snow does that? Yeah, it's actually, it's fascinating. Um, it turns out, guys, that especially on high mountain peaks where you've got really cold, dry air and a lot of airflow from wind, um, a lot of the snowpack will actually just go away because it's so cold it can't melt, it sublimates. And so you actually see, and if you've ever seen this, if you've ever dug around in old snow and it feels really grainy, the reason is because that snow, all the facets, a lot of the molecules in those facets have sublimated and it creates round edges and it totally changes the nature of the snowpack. Um, so there's a whole field called snow science and the University of Utah is one of the leaders in snow science and one of the things they talk about is how snow sublimates. It's really interesting. Okay, and then guys, by the way, you need to know this term, the opposite of sublimation is deposition. So in order for them to make carb in order for them to make dry ice, they take um, carbon dioxide gas and they cause it to deposit, which is the process of deposition. And why that works, we're gonna look at in a couple minutes. So guys, you good on terminology? Are we good? Okay. So now guys, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about the so what's. So why is it then that these things change from solid to liquid to gas? Why does this stuff happen? So I'm going to show it to you in video form, and then we're going to talk about the nitty gritties that you guys need to understand. When heat is applied to a solid, it's temperature. So guys, let's talk about this solid. First of all, you'll notice the organized structure held together by intermolecular forces, but you'll also notice our temperature scale that's got melting and boiling, and right now we're below melting and therefore it's a solid. But guys, what are these molecules doing? Sublimating. I don't know why they included them, but they look good so we can talk about them. All right. So what you're going to see, guys, is the temperature of this solid is going to begin to go up. And guys, they don't do a great job of this in the video, but as the temperature goes up, how should these molecules be changing? They should be wiggling faster. They don't do a great job of it, but they should. ...and vapor pressure increase with increasing temperature because the molecules of the solid have increasing kinetic energy. At the melting temperature... So now guys, and this is a pretty good representation. At the melting point, you can see the structure breaking down. Does the temperature change as this melts? Yes. 
No, guys, you got to understand that. That's the lab that you're doing right now. When things melt, when things freeze, when things boil, when things condense, the temperature doesn't change, the phase changes. So here we go. Heat is absorbed as the solid is converted to liquid at a constant temperature. Hey, oh poop. <laughs> What's up? Oh, it's a really, I mean, is this like cute or is this important? Okay, if it's important, you can have her. The end of the period would be better. Is that okay? Addie, you, do you need to go? Okay, all right. Because the molecules of the solid have increasing kinetic energy. At the melting temperature, heat is absorbed as the solid is converted to liquid at a constant temperature. So guys, once this whole thing is melted, what's it going to start to do? As we continue that heat, when melting is complete, the temperature of the liquid and its vapor pressure increase. At the boiling point, temperature remains constant as heat is absorbed to convert the liquid to the gas phase. When all the molecules are in the gas phase, the temperature again increases as the gas phase molecules acquire additional kinetic energy. Is that all jiving with your understandings? So guys, the question then becomes, what if we graph that information? What if we tracked adding heat and we graph that against temperature? Can you see that we would end up with a graph like this? So the idea is down here, when as we're adding energy, down here we're at low energy, what phase are we in? Solid, then it melts, then we're liquid, then it boils and then you guys remember that from last year guys these are also the graphs that you're generating in lab right only you're just generating this part because you froze the cyclohexane then you heated it up in the room and as it did eventually that temperature stopped or it should have stopped changing and that's the point at which it was melting and then it would just continue up again to like 10 or 12 or wherever you went were you gonna say something Bill? you guys good on the ideas Okay, so guys, in my mind then, we're comfortable with this idea of phases and the way these things interact as they change. Anything more there y'all want to talk about? We okay? Okay, then guys, we're, go ahead, Tucker. The structure, yeah, and, and the answer is contained in your question. Because when a solid melts, you're simply breaking the structure. The molecules are still, inner, are still um, associated with each other. They're just not in rigid structure. And you understand that structure is about energy. So you have to add energy to make that structure collapse. But it takes even more energy to rip those things apart and get them to dissociate completely. So it's less energy to collapse than it is to rip apart. Go ahead. That's a good question. And the answer is a little, but not that much. Because the problem is, is that intermolecular forces weaken over distance. And so it gets even more complicated because, because IMFs weaken over distance, when solids melt, they, um, they, they actually, um, they, they spread out a little bit. So they're more dense in their solid form. And then when they collapse into a liquid, they do spread out a little bit and that causes their IMFs to weaken. The thing that's weird is that water, and we're gonna talk about this more in a minute, water is the only substance on earth with the exception of one really exotic salt that you'll never find. It's the only substance on earth where the opposite is true. So ice is bigger than liquid water. So when ice melts, it actually collapses and the IMFs even strengthen a little bit. And water is the only substance that does that, which is a huge pain in the butt because like that's why our pipes break in the winter, right? Liquid water expands when it freezes, it gets bigger and blows our pipes apart. And water is the only substance on earth that does that. And we're gonna talk more about that in a minute. Go ahead, Robbie. Well, 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And so without this phenomenon, because you're right, so you understand that when water freezes, it expands, making it less dense. If that weren't true, fish would all die because the lakes would freeze from the bottom to the top and all the fish would die. And I mean, there are so many things that are true because of this phenomenon. Yeah. But the thing, if, if this wasn't true, all the icebergs would be on the bottom of the oceans, right? If our, if our oceans were made of any liquid other than water, the icebergs would be on the bottom because every other substance is solid, sinks in its liquid except for water. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Clear ice. Yeah, yeah. That's a great question. And so uh, a, another interesting example of that to me, uh, have you ever bought like a chocolate bar and left it in your car and it's melted and you're like, oh crap, you throw it in the fridge to refreeze it and then you open it and it looks white. Yeah. Have you ever noticed that? So the, the difference is this. So whether it's ice or whether it's chocolate or whatever it is, um, it's a function of crystal structure. Um, that when water freezes slowly, it freezes in a more organized fashion. When water freezes quickly, it still forms these structures, but it's not as perfect. It has imperfections in it, and we experience those imperfections as cloudiness. Um, it can also be stuff in the in the water. Um, if you freeze, if you freeze, if you boil water and then freeze it, it freezes clear because boiling the water drives all the gases out of the water. And then when it freezes, there isn't oxygen and carbon dioxide trapped in the ice. Um, we're actually going to do some of that in lab later. Um, but if you freeze, if you were to freeze like carbonated water, it would be cloudy because of the carbonation that's trapped. So the cloudiness or imperfections um, relative to chocolate bars. Um, actually, what's happening is, is when the Hershey's makes chocolate bars, they, they freeze that liquid chocolate under a very specific set of conditions that causes it to freeze into that beautiful chocolatey thing. If you freeze it too quickly, you get those imperfections and then it looks like it's almost got mold on it. It's all white and cloudy and that's why. Um, crystals form differently depending upon the conditions in which they form. So. Yeah, kind of crazy. You guys good on these ideas? Are we, are we okay? All right, so guys, now we're gonna have the so what's conversation. So we understand that liquids contain intermolecular forces, but guys, there's all sorts of practical things that you need to know about liquids based solely on this. Now guys, one of these you ran into in the pre-lab for the last lab that we did. Remember when it talked about vapor pressure and I just told you to skip it because we haven't talked about it? We're gonna talk about it now. So guys, these, and this may be where you wanna start jotting down notes if you haven't. Guys, there are some fundamental properties of liquids that you need to understand based upon intermolecular forces. Now guys, some of these are new, some of these you already know, but guys, fundamentally, here's the deal. When you think about a liquid, imagine a beaker of water. So guys, when we think about a beaker of water, we've got to understand that these water molecules are exhibiting intermolecular forces. The ones in the middle are being pulled in all directions and the ones on the surface are being pulled only down because the ones up above, you know, there's nothing above to pull up. But guys, the idea is that if you're in a beaker of liquid water, you are getting pulled in many, many, many directions. Um, and the ones that are on the surface are being pulled backwards. They're being held back. So guys, with that understanding, these are the things that you need to be able to think through. So guys, the first one is how these intermolecular forces relate to viscosity. So guys, if you don't know, viscosity is determined, is defined as a resistance to flow. So molasses is very viscous. It doesn't flow very well. But water does. So guys, the question is, what does viscosity have to do with intermolecular forces? 
which liquids would tend to be more viscous, the ones with stronger, weak intermolecular forces? Strong, right? The stronger the intermolecular, and this is the relationship you may want to write down. I don't even know if I've got it in my notes. I don't. Um, but guys, the idea is that there is a direct relationship between intermolecular force strength and viscosity. Yeah. Yeah, that was exactly where I wanted to go with this. So, guys, let, so direct relationship, right? But Talmud, you're right on it. If water is so polar, why isn't it also very viscous? And the answer is because there's another factor that plays into this, which is size. Um, water molecules are so small. Um, and do you get, have we talked about how they measure viscosity? You can actually buy a viscosity meter. Um, it's actually a really tall graduated cylinder. And what you do is you fill it with a predetermined amount of the liquid, and then it ships with a ball of a predetermined size and mass density. And you drop the ball into the liquid and you actually measure how long it takes to go from point A to point B. And then there's a conversion table that you can convert into viscosity. Um, the trick is, is that if you were to drop a ball all through water. Yeah, these molecules are really tightly packed together, but they're also so small and light that they just get out of the way so quickly. But water is way more viscous than it should be given the size of these molecules. Other liquids with molecules like the size of water are way less viscous than water is. But oil is so viscous because the molecules are so big, they just can't get out of their own way. And they're just, they're thick and gooey. So, yeah. But you guys, um, so I don't know if you guys even think about this. If you own a car, have you gone and got an oil change? And has the person at Jiffy Lube ever asked you what kind of oil you want? Have you ever had that conversation? Do any of you know what type of oil is in your car? Do you what? Right, but what weight? Yeah, so guys, if you're interested, so the guy at Jiffy Lube comes to you and says, what weight oil do you want to use in your car? And you say, 30 weight. Guys, that's actually not a weight. Um, that number 30 is actually a measure of the viscosity of the oil. So if you put 10 weight oil in your car, that is low viscosity oil. If you put 30 weight oil in your car, that's higher viscosity, 40s even heavier, 50s even heavier. So why would you want different viscosity oils in your car? Well guys, what if the oil that you put in there is not viscous enough? What's gonna happen? It's not going to lubricate. It's not going to get in there and do its job, and you're going to burn your car out. But guys, what if you put oil in your car that is too viscous? Your car won't start. That oil sits in the bottom of your engine, and it becomes so thick, especially on cold days, that your car won't turn over because you've got sludge in the bottom of your oil pan. So guys, some cars will actually recommend that you use thinner oil in the winter and heavier oil in the summer to make up for those differences. Huh? You're learning so much. But guys, what, have you ever looked at your oil thing and it says 1040? You ever seen that? These are multi-viscosity oils. Guys, the chemistry behind this is magic, but they are actually oils that will change their viscosity depending upon the stresses that are put on them. So if your engine is working really, really hard towing a trailer, the oil becomes thicker and more protective. And then if you're just cruising to the grocery store, the oil becomes thinner and flows more readily. It's called multi-viscosity oil. And the chemistry is really cool. Yeah, yeah it's, kind of, it's not exactly that. Those are what are called non-Newtonian fluids. Um, and it's not exactly that, but it is the same in that these molecules have the ability to change, this is cool, they have their ability to change their geometry and therefore their polarity and therefore their viscosity. Yeah, it's pretty neat, yeah. No, and so that's actually, 
I'm realizing we're going to end up having this split today up, and that's just fine. The last thing that we're going to talk about today are the natures of solids, and we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about crystalline solids and amorphous solids. Um, putty is an amorphous solid. It is in fact a solid, but it's a solid without shape. Morph means shape, a means without, and so an amorphous solid is a solid that doesn't have shape, and that's what putty is. Yeah. A, the jello is actually also an amorphous solid. Yeah, yeah, the thing that's really interesting, and if you, you could go back to our definition, it doesn't flow, right? It, does, it, it melts easily, but it doesn't flow. It is definitely a solid. Guys, the thing that's crazy, and I don't know if you know this, ooh, glass, there is actually still a lot of debate going on about whether glass is a solid or a liquid. You guys... Yeah, right. There's they. I, my understanding. Sorry, I lost a chlorine. Um, there it is. Oh, I'll be back. Okay. So, guys, my understanding is I think the most recent research is saying that it is in fact a solid, but there's actually some research that's showing that glass could be a very, very viscous liquid. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Oh yeah, but pitch and tar are things that flow. Because they flow, they're liquids. But there's other things that don't, and therefore we're not quite sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, and actually, Grayson, that's part of the argument, is that, yeah, they, they find old, old panes of glass. Like, not, in, you know, we think in the U.S. we're old. We're talking about, like, Elizabethan, way back European homes that were built hundreds of years ago and you look at the glass and it actually has settled um, it's been flowing downhill against gravity and you can actually see it puddling almost like a teardrop a, a drop of it really there's evidence that glass flows under the force of gravity which is an argument towards it being a liquid yeah Don't confuse stretching with flowing. That's ductal, which is different than flowing. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, and 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 that's one of the arguments is that under when it was originally cast and when it was cooling, it flowed when it before it froze, um, but. And again, this is an argument, not an, a conversation that's still taking place. And I don't know where current thinking is, but there have been other people that have debunked that idea and found glasses in unique situations where that can't be the case. And they're also, I believe, seeing flow. Yeah, go ahead. I still have a question about putty. Yeah. Just on my mind, my sister has some stuff that, like, if you put it in a ball, it's like putty, that if you put it in a ball, you leave it on the counter. When you come back to go to the room, it's still flat. Like, yeah. It depends. I mean, and, and again, there are gray areas, right? Because, I mean, the most immediate example of that is, is Talmadge was thinking was oobleck. I don't know if you've ever, cornstarch and water. And if you move it, it remains a solid, but the minute you stop, it settles and it flows, right? Um, and those, those are actually, well, it's a whole nother really interesting realm of phase. They're called, they're called um, non-Newtonian fluids. And it's, uh, it's, it's, there's all sorts of fascinating stuff. You guys good on this idea of viscosity? I love that you love it. So guys, let's do these two quickly. Adhesive and cohesive forces. Also functions of intermolecular forces. So guys, adhesive forces are forces between <coughs> substances. They bind one substance to another. Cohesive forces are forces within a substance that bind them to each other. Um, and we'll talk more about this in a minute. If you have a hard time remembering which is which, I always like to think that adhes ad adhesives are glues. So glues stick different things together. So adhesion is different things together. Cohesion is the same stuff together. Yeah. 
Say that again. Well, it depends. So it depends. So um, yeah. So the forces that hold water together are at are cohesive forces, right? So these intermolecular forces that stick water together are cohesive. But then you also understand that water in a graduated cylinder, water forms a meniscus. And why does water form a meniscus? And the answer is adhesive forces, that the water is attracted to the glass. There's an intermolecular force between the points of polarity in the glass and the, and the polar water molecules. And that adhesive force causes the water to be drawn up the sides. And there we have adhesion. So water, so it's, it's not really a question of what water has, it's what does water do with other things. So water sticks to itself through dipole-dipole forces. Water sticks to glass. I mean, we need to know the structure of glass, but it's probably dipole-dipole too. Is that? No, 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 no. So, so the idea is that these are the results of intermolecular forces. So adhesive forces and cohesive forces could be caused by London, they could be caused by induced dipoles, it could be dipole-dipole, could be hydrogen forces, could be ion dipole. So like the forces that exist when water dissolves salt, right? So that would be an example of an adhesive force because it's between two different substances, but this would be ion dipole. Um, water sticking to water would also, this would be a cohesive force because it's the same substance, but this would be hydrogen forces. So these are a coverall that just describe how these intermolecular forces cause things to interact together. Is that okay? You guys good on these ideas? Is that okay? So, you know what guys, I think we're just going to not try to push. Um, we are not going to get into phase diagrams today. Um, we're going to stop about halfway through the day because I don't want to rush. I'm throwing stuff all over. I don't want to rush through this. I'd rather do this well than do this fast. Um, we weren't going to get the test in before Christmas anyway. Um, so guys, let's, let's, um, so you're good on adhesive and cohesive forces? Okay, so I've got a question for you then, now that we have a little bit of time to play with this. Guys, based upon adhesive and cohesive forces, why do we wax our cars? And it's not, I mean, for some of you, it looks nice. Yeah, 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 yeah. So guys, the idea is this. If you've ever waxed your car and then, exp and then gone and driven in a rainstorm, ready, here's... There's your car, right? Okay, so the idea is this. It is your car. There's you. Okay. So guys, the idea is this. If your car is not waxed, guys, the molecules that, let's say, whose car is this? What color is your car? Pick a new color. What color do you wish it was? A fine choice. There you go. So guys, here's the idea. Paint molecules, the molecules and all of the binders that hold this all together, guys, those are very polar molecules, right? They form a very, a very tight solid. We know those things are polar. So the idea is that the paint and the binders and the things that make up the finish of our car are very polar substances. So when it rains, these, the, these, the, the water spreads out and it puddles. If you've ever had it rain on your car and your car isn't waxed, you've seen the water just spread out in sheets on the hood of your car. Which is stronger, the adhesive or the cohesive forces? The adhesive forces. The water is strongly attracted to the car and it just spreads out. Now guys, imagine that you then wax your car. So guys, when you put a coat of wax, which, all right, 
Grace and your car is no longer, you're, you just got a red car. Grayson's car is now red because we're going to make the wax yellow. It's a sandwich. So now, guys, we've waxed Grayson's car. But, guys, what do we know about wax? Polar or nonpolar? Big nonpolar molecules. Why is it a solid? Induced dipoles, right? And guys, those induced dipoles are weak and it means that wax melts very readily, which you already knew, but we rub it on there and we coat the hood of the car with wax, but those wax molecules are very nonpolar. So now when it rains on your car, the water beads up. Now which forces are stronger, cohesive or adhesive? And it's not because the cohesive got stronger, it's because the adhesive got weaker because the wax is not polar and that water beads up and rolls right off the car. Go ahead. That's a good question and it's actually, this is weird, it is a induced dipole, dipole force. So the molecules in the finish of the car, the paint and the binders, are all very polar molecules and they actually induce dipoles in the wax, well, kind of. Remember the wax, the wax molecules can have slight imperfections which makes them a little polar, but it's really those slight imperfections and the induced dipoles that are then attracted to the, to the, um, to the, the paint. So, yeah. Getting the ideas? Yeah? Right. Right, right, exactly. But so the water is slightly attracted to the glass, enough that it sticks, the same forces that cause the meniscus. But you've also got a lot of air moving as you're driving, right? And that, and that pushes the water off. But have you ever put what's called Rain-X on the windshield of your car? So Rain-X is actually, a, it's a, it's, they sell it in bottles, you spray it on, you wipe it off. And I love Rain-X because I never need to use my windshield wipers because Rain-X is actually a liquid that you put on your window that causes, it's like wax for your window. Um, it's, it's a very thin polymer and it actually sits on your windshield. And if you're driving down the freeway, the wind is enough to blow the water off of your, off of your wind. You, it's really fascinating stuff. But it's the same idea that you've got those adhesive forces that are made weaker by the Rain-X. So you guys good on all of this? Okay, so now guys, we need to talk about vapor pressure and a couple other things, and then we're gonna wrap this up. So guys, this is important. This is hugely important. And it's weird how we talk about this. So let me define it for you, and then we'll dig into it more deeply. So guys, vapor pressure Vapor pressure, guys, is defined as the pressure of the gas supported over a liquid. And again, remember the big idea here. Jason got us thinking about this relative to adhesion and cohesion. What we're trying to do is we're trying to tie intermolecular forces to these ideas. So guys, again, vapor pressure is the pressure of a gas supported, and that's the, use, the word we use, a, is supported over the liquid. So guys, I'm not gonna give you any more relative to notes on this. Draw a picture with me. So do this, draw two beakers side by side. And in the left-hand beaker, let's put our good friend water and then guys in the right hand beaker and I'm just gonna stick with blue but in the right hand beaker we're gonna put methanol no let's don't in the left hand beaker let's put cyclohexane Hi. 
now you've decided it's important. Addie, she's never gonna just. <laughs> she knows the way to my heart. Okay, so guys, now what you need to do is this. Put a lid on your beakers. Okay, so here's the idea. Guys, if you can picture, would it be helpful if I drew water molecules or can you just understand they're there? Is that okay? You know what, maybe we could draw them as circles. So we're just gonna let these circles represent our bent, hi. Um, we're just gonna let these circles represent our bent and therefore polar water molecules. And then guys, similarly, let's do that over here and let's let circles represent our bent and therefore polar, no, sorry, our symmetrical and therefore nonpolar benzene molecules. So guys, let's talk. What are the intermolecular forces that hold water together as a liquid? Hydrogen forces. You might want to write it down. What are the forces that hold benzene, no, cyclohexane together as a liquid? Induced dipoles. You guys good? You okay? All right. Now, guys, this is the idea. Take your picture and turn it into a video. What are these water molecules doing? They're wiggling, right? They're bouncing all around. But what happens when they get to the surface? Hold on. Are you back now for good? Okay. When's Leah coming back? Okay, so guys, this way and not that way. You gotta understand this. What are these molecules doing? They're moving. What happens when they get to the surface? They jump into the empty space above the liquid. What do we call that process? Evaporation. Guys, these things evaporate. Okay, so guys, now I'm concerned, and this is the point where I've got to step in and be the adult and say, knock it off and focus. Because if you don't understand this, you're going to get smushed. And some of you right now haven't picked up that the tone has changed and it's time to focus and learn. I know it was interesting to talk about waxing cars, and it's neat that we can talk about that stuff, but I'm sick of the interruptions. Focus. Don't make me say this again. You guys good? Okay, so those molecules are moving and they are evaporating. What are these molecules doing? Also moving and evaporating, right? But don't draw them yet because guys, let's focus on this. So now that some of these molecules have evaporated, what are these molecules doing? Moving around like gases, right? But guys, what happens if they run into the surface of the liquid? They stick. And what do we call the opposite of evaporation? Condensation. So guys, we have got condensation and evaporation happening at the same time. Now guys, very, very quickly, the condensation and the evaporation happen at the same rate. What do we call that condition where things are happening at the same rate? Equilibrium. This reaches equilibrium. Now guys, the trick is this, and we haven't talked about this idea, but we will. When we talk about this gas then that is, ready, here's the word, that is supported over the liquid, Guys, this gas is moving all over and it's pushing against the container and it exerts a pressure. Get the idea? So the pressure that this gas exerts on the container is what we call vapor pressure. So vapor pressure is the pressure of the gas supported over the liquid. Now guys, let's make, a, let's, let's, let's make some predictions. So guys, which are stronger, hydrogen forces or induced dipoles? 
hydrogen forces. So the forces in the cyclohexane are weaker. What's going to be true of the vapor pressure? Will it be higher or lower? It's higher. Guys, the idea is this. These molecules inside the cyclohexane are less tightly bound. Therefore, more of them jump into the gas phase. Because there is physically more gas in the gas phase, when these reach equilibrium, this will have a higher vapor pressure. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, okay. That's a really, really good question. So, guys, let me just lay this out there for you. Talmadge is saying, what about the gas that's already in there? The nitrogen, the oxygen, the components of the air. The answer to that question is one of the things that makes this unit ridiculously complicated because it turns out that you're right. There is nitrogen and oxygen and all the components of the air up in this space and they all behave as if the other one's not there. So the amount of this gas that can diffuse, that can go up into vapor, is independent of how much gas is already there. You're gonna find out that one of the tricky things about gases is they behave as if other gases are not present. They're so spread out that there's enough free space inside of them that the amount of this that can evaporate is not dependent on the gases that are already there. Um, we're going to quantify that and talk about Dalton's law of partial pressures, which is coming in a couple days. But it seems simple until it gets weird. But the answer to your question is no. The amount of gas that's up there does not influence the amount that can evaporate. Go ahead. They both reach equilibrium. But the difference is the pressure of this will be higher than the pressure of that. Because more of this can evaporate, there will be more gas and therefore more pressure up here than there is up there. You may remember Pivnert. And the idea is that the amount of gas is N. So the more gas that's present, the more pressure there will be. So there are physically more molecules there and therefore a greater pressure. So, guys, you okay on this idea of partial pressure? I know I had to sort of sit on you a little bit to bring you back together, but guys, it's critical that you understand this idea. So let's do this then. What is the relationship between vapor pressure and the strength of intermolecular forces? Is it inverse or direct? It is inverse. The stronger the intermolecular forces, the um, lower the vapor pressure which you see in this idea. The higher the intermolecular forces, the more energy that is needed to get these things to escape. And therefore, guys, the lower the vapor pressure. Is that all jive? Yeah. 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 You, yeah, you, well, not a lot, but you will, because you're absolutely right that when you pull the, 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 what's it called? Parafilm. When you pull the parafilm off, you're going to lose all of that gas, right? But here, so here's the idea. So the whole time that, you, no, test tube. So the whole time that you were doing the lab, that parafilm was, or the, the cyclohexane, there was no parafilm. The cyclohexane was exposed to the atmosphere. So the whole time, this stuff is evaporating away. You could probably smell it, right? So this cyclohexane was evaporating the whole time. So when you remove the parafilm, all that you're doing is just allowing that evaporation process to continue. So you're not losing any more cyclohexane by removing that as you would have lost anyway, just leaving it open. Does that make sense? You're just shortening. It's like stopping time is really what you're doing. 
So, yeah. You guys good on these ideas? Okay. So, guys, you'll notice then that one more idea flew in, and you need to make sense of this idea. So, all of this then influences boiling point. So if you have high intermolecular forces, it takes more energy to get these things to escape. Those things have lower vapor pressures, as you've described, but this also means they have higher boiling points. So guys, if we take that idea and relate it back to this, which one of these two liquids, water or cyclohexane, will have the higher boiling point? the water. The water is more tightly bound, it's got a lower vapor pressure, and also therefore a higher boiling point. Does that sit okay? Okay. So that then, guys, leads us to this idea, and then we're done. When we talk about boiling point and volatility, these are related ideas. Volatility is the ability to evaporate Boiling is the point where evaporation has, there's enough energy that all of it just converts to a gas. But guys, both of these are related to intermolecular forces. The stronger the intermolecular forces, the lower the volatility. The stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the boiling point. So these are things that we talked about last year. If you wanna to touch on them anymore, we can. But guys, that's where we're gonna to stop today. Um, and we're going to talk homework. How you guys doing? Yeah. Um, why does oil have such a high boiling point? Exactly. Yeah. So um, these, and I think it was Addie to ask when we were grading homework about this idea of what does it mean that induced dipoles can be stronger than even dipole-dipole forces. And that's an example of that. These oil molecules are so big and polarizable that they create strong enough intermolecular forces that they boil at ridiculously high temperatures. And it's just, so part of it is a function directly of mass. It's just hard to get fat things to jump up in the air. But it's also a function of the fact that these things are so polarizable that they tie together really tightly. They really do have very, very strong intermolecular forces, and therefore they boil at really high temperatures. Yeah, it's interesting. You guys good? Yeah, Robbie. Yeah? Yeah, so there's two ways to do it. One would be in a vacuum. You could draw a vacuum and then you could allow that gas to bleed into, into, into a, an, an empty container. But the other thing that you can do is this. Um, um, all I said is these things will evaporate, evaporate without, without consideration. What, 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 else, what else is in there? In there? What, we can what we can do is this. We can, we can measure, measure the pressure, pressure of, of the gases, gases that are in there. So what is the pressure of the air? Then when this evaporates, the pressure will Go up. Um, um, the amount the amount pressure, pressure goes up, up is the is pressure the pressure of the gas, gas, gas evaporating. So so, so the so pressure is added, added, added. The amount that is evaporating is not a function of how much stuff is already there, there. but there is a there is pressure, pressure, pressure what's already, already, already there, there. there, and the pressure, the pressure will go up from that point. We can measure measure that. So yeah yeah. Yeah. They do not, but when, so when, when water boils, we know that the intermolecular forces have got to break, right? But in order for those intermolecular forces to break, you understand that they weaken as distance increases. So really what we're doing, why do those intermolecular forces break? And the answer is not, obviously, can we pretend that that's water? So the answer is not that water magically becomes nonpolar, right? The reason they break is because you're adding enough energy to these water molecules that they dance enough, that they spread out enough that the forces become unimportant. In the same way that if you have magnets, if you separate them by enough distance, they may as well not be magnets because they're not attracting each other, but they're still magnetic. So the question then becomes, 
what is it that keeps these water molecules from spreading out? And one of the answers is air pressure. Literally, air pressure is pushing down on this and keeping them close together. So the less air pressure is pushing down on them, the easier it is to spread them out and weaken those forces. And so as a result, um, pressure plays a great part in boiling because as we decrease that atmospheric pressure, it becomes easier for them to spread out and break apart. Yeah, it's hard though because we don't think about it that way because when we think about vapor pressure, we think about something with a lid. And when you put a lid on it, then all of a sudden, um, the uh, then air pressure is a non-issue. But yeah, in theory, that if you were, if you could measure the vapor pressure of the gas as you decrease the atmospheric pressure, the vapor pressure would go up as atmospheric pressure goes down because they can more readily jump into the gas phase. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. That's exactly right. Harder. So think about it. So we understand that this has a, I love that you're processing this, Jason. So the idea is that this has got a lower vapor pressure, right? That means it doesn't do this as easily. And because it doesn't do this as easily, it's hard to get all of it to do this, which is boiling. So we have to raise it to a higher temperature to get it to do that and boil. So they're saying the same thing. Low vapor pressure means hard to become a gas. High boiling point also means hard to become a gas because you've got to add more energy to rip the thing apart. Is that okay? So guys, let's do this to wrap up the day. Um, let me find the page and then I'll lead you to it. You guys have your books? Um, here we go. Open up your books to 1058. The question is this, what else does vapor, does vapor pressure depend upon? We understand that molecules with low intermolecular forces will have high vapor pressures. But guys, look at the table. This is a vapor pressure table for water. What else influences the vapor pressure of water? temperature. But guys, join me at the board. Does that make sense? As we heat up the water, what do these molecules do? Well, they move faster and it's easier for them to become a gas and it's harder for them to recondense as a liquid and therefore the vapor pressure goes up. Get the idea? Now let me ask you this. What are the units? What are the units for pressure in this? Tor, right? Do you happen to remember the value for standard pressure in TOR? It's 760. Guys, find that in the table. No, it's not. It's 101.3. Sorry. No, it's not. Where's it? Oh, it, I'm sorry. It is 760. I was thinking kilopascals. It's 760. But guys, at what temperature does that happen? Aha. That's why the boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius at sea level. Because at 100 degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure of water is 760, is it tor? 760 tor, which is the pressure at sea level. And that's, how it, that's the pressure it needs to boil to overcome the pressure of the atmosphere. Which kind of gets added to what you were talking about, right? So, you see that connection? I think that's interesting. Go ahead, Jason. Absolutely. Yeah. So both pressure and temp. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so maybe the way I put that together in my head is if you want to know atmospheric pressure, boil water and figure out its temperature. Boiling water is a barometer because if you know the temperature at which it boils, you can convert it to a pressure. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Okay. You guys good? All right. So guys, let's look then at homework. We're going to stop here, um, but it leaves us in sort of an interesting spot. Um, so um, this is your homework. This is all qualitative. 
but guys, we're you can't do it all. Um, but we, you know what? We're not going to talk about the well Monday. Uh, we'll answer questions on Monday, um, but we're not going to record scores on Monday. We will wrap this up, and uh, and then we'll we'll move on from there. Um, guys, this will rearrange the calendar. So if you're watching the calendar closely because you've got things coming up with Christmas, we are going to push things back. Um, but this is where we're at. So, you guys done taking pictures? I felt weird photobombing your homework assignment.